Alright, and everyone is welcome to start asking questions at any time. Just, I had to fix some streaming settings and I wanted to make sure I caught them early because I already made a boo-boo and had to take down the stream with 17 people already in it, so. Pros and cons of starting early. quick audio test, make sure I'm not garbled or anything.
So for anybody that might be in chat already, uh, what projects are you guys working on? Anybody started playing around with the Lynx Toolkit yet? Uh, and if there's anything specific you guys are curious about with the Lynx Toolkit and starting to move beyond some of the uh, built-in features, uh, let me know and we can maybe get to them during my chat. Uh, there will not be any slides or anything. This is going to be all just messing around in LabVIEW and looking at demos and stuff. Are you, have you just started playing around with the toolkit yet, or have you had a... Oh. Message is gone. Okay, so... You did, in fact, want to say that, it seems. Uh, have you uh, deployed anything, done any specific projects with it, or have you just kind of experimented with it so far? Yeah, I I have a webcam on my robot, but it's not being done through LabVIEW yet. Uh, eventually, one of the things I want to work on is making an OpenCV wrapper that would be available from the LabVIEW side. But right now, there's not much available directly from LabVIEW. Um, using that SSH trick, the chroot SSH trick that I posted about in Sam Sharp's uh, previous um, sessions Discord channel, you can access the Raspberry Cam executable to grab snapshots of the Raspberry Pi's built-in camera, and you could probably do something similar for grabbing frames, um, but as far as direct capture yet, I'm not aware of anything, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist yet, but... Um, right now, a lot of stuff that would be easily accessible on the Pi, like USB and all that, um, I haven't played around with with trying to access stuff like that directly in the, uh, the LabVIEW environment yet.
Um, so Jonathan tried using the beep VI, but it didn't work. So yeah, so we'll talk a little bit when I talk about some of the limitations of the LabVIEW on a Raspberry Pi. Um, but basically the LabVIEW environment runs in its own little isolated system. It's not quite a virtual machine running inside the Pi. Uh, but it doesn't have direct access to stuff like sound and anything that's available from the Pi itself. Ah, so you're going to be doing some instrument control, Adrian. Oh, I just muted myself. Hello, Mike. How is it going? I've got, I do live streaming. Uh, I've done live streaming on Twitch. And I also produce uh, a live stream that I've teamed up with one of the local alliance partners to do uh, virtual user groups now that we're not doing them in person. Uh, so I've got all sorts of goodies. Also, this isn't a meeting platform that's getting used by everybody that's working remotely these days. Uh, YouTube is kind of built for bandwidth. Uh, and uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but Boss Von Etten. Uh, they're using similar hardware to create a small robot tank with the Raspberry Pi and the Lynx library. Awesome. Have, did you see some of the details I posted in the Discord channel? Awesome. What uh, what approach are you using? Are you driving that directly? Are you driving that directly from the Raspberry Pi? Okay. Yeah, and with tank treads, you usually don't worry about odometry too much. Ninety-six eighty-five. Is that that? That's not that same Adafruit breakout that Sam Sharp was showing off, was it? Okay, yeah, it is. 
Cool, yeah. <laughs> that would certainly be an easy way to accomplish that. Alright, we can tell we're getting close, those concurrent viewer counts starting to climb. I was muted. Uh, thank you for that Twitter post, Swindley. Hello, Stefan. Uh, Mike A. <laughs> I, I can picture the jumble of letters in my head of what the name is supposed to look like. I have a lotus. I have a, something. All right. So it's time. Welcome to our show. Alright, so I also have a whole bunch of toys that I've been playing with. Uh, not all of this I, has been getting touched with uh, links yet, but um, I've been using a bunch of these little Arduino clones. Not as Arduinos, but uh, eventually I'll be doing stuff like synchronizing a whole bunch of uh, sonar sensors. Uh, I've got one of those robotic vacuum cleaner LiDARs that I've got all my measurements right for making a stand for it. So now I can start working on getting this into a robot. Um, yeah, I've just got a bunch of stuff. Eventually, I will be getting back into doing custom expansion boards for the Pi. So the last time I was into this kind of thing was... Back when it was just the first Raspberry Pi that only had the 28 pin header. Um, but now that LabVIEW has, uh, is available for running on the Pi, I'm starting to knock the rust off of all of those old skills I have. Um, so let me get back to this. I've got a couple of things to move around and make some room for. But in the meantime, uh, let's actually look at the screen. I need to get my OBS set up so I can see that and chat at the same time. There we go. So the robot that many of you have either seen from the um, from the Discord channel or my many many uh, Twitter and LinkedIn posts uh, is now sitting outside and I am connected to it over Wi-Fi. Uh, it currently has the GPS fix, so I set it outside so that I could actually get a GPS fix, so we could actually poke some wires and see what's going on. Although it seems to not really like what's going on now. But, also another thing, I've had a cough for like two, two and a half months now, so if I randomly get quiet, it's probably because I've muted myself, so you all don't have to hear my, uh, my crazy coughing. Okay, boss for that. And so I am, I'll be demoing something very similar. Um, I am doing web control from a browser. Where'd my mouse cursor go? Uh, so that picture should jump, maybe. Maybe I'm a little too far away for the, the LabVIEW stuff to run. Um, but I've got a WebSocket server running on the robot that this web page can send joystick commands to. But now that Everybody's here. Uh, I'm going to all make you go wait 
for a minute while I go grab this robot so we can go talk about it. Uh, and hopefully it the, the GPS acquisition stays for a little bit, um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff to take a look at. I suspect it's going to lose its GPS acquisition pretty quickly if it hasn't already. Yeah, we've already lost acquisition. Okay, so LabVIEW Community is now released, which is awesome. Um, trying to do all the mind sharing of all of the robotic stuff that I used to do while I still do a full-time job doing LabVIEW. Uh, some of that is, you know, competes with the number of brain cells that I have left in functioning. Uh, so uh, this is super awesome that LabVIEW is now widely available for free to run on things like Raspberry Pis. However, there are some limitations. And uh, <laughs> Mike, and uh, so I've been doing a bunch of custom development, custom firmware on the Arduino clones that I run uh, to work around some of those. So the what is the LabVIEW Lynx toolkit great for? It's great for basic prototyping. It's great for when you only ever need to do one I.O. operation at a time. Um, and especially when you're interfacing to, th well, if you're using the Pi's output directly or you're using a Pi hat, um, you get a lot more flexibility. But if you're trying to then also interface to things like Arduinos um, or you're trying to use the SPI bus, which has some big limitations in the Lynx toolkit, um, you'll start to run into issues if you try to do too much at once. Um, so with this robot, what I'm doing is I've got a bunch of screws that are holding this lid shut. Um, but I've got an Arduino clone. I've got a little Arduino nano board sitting inside this that is doing a lot of the motor control calculations for me so that I don't have to hog up the Raspberry Pi's processing power with that. So get this cracked open, do a quick tour of the hardware for anybody that might not be coming. From the Discord channel and having seen my details post. Oh, it looks like I got a, a an ant hitched a ride from outside. So inside, I've got an Arduino board that's running custom firmware that is communicating to the Raspberry Pi over the I squared C bus, and then we've got an L two ninety eight dual motor driver board. Oh, yeah, there's another ant in there. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to have to put down some ant traps now. Uh, and then I've got these two geared motors which have encoders on the back. Uh, and this thing gets over 15,000 counts per meter of travel. Um, so trying to do that through links on the Raspberry Pi, that m I might be able to do that, and that would be about the only thing I'd be able to do on the Raspberry Pi. So we offload that to external processors. Um, we still can't interface to those through the Lynx Toolkit unless we develop our own code, which is what I've done. I've also got an IMU here. So this is a different IMU. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I forgot I wasn't focusing on the code. Um, so this IMU, it's the BNO055. It is awesome. Uh, it's not the one that comes included in the Lynx Toolkit. Now I need to open up a I need to make a VI I can open up quick 
so let's take a look at the Lynx Toolkit sensors. So we'll swap back. So there are some devices already included in that they have support for. Uh, like they've got this six axis unit, which has accelerometer and gyros. I think this is just accelerometers. I'm not familiar with these part numbers. Um, but with these, you have to do a lot of the, you have to do all the math to integrate all that data and get an orientation yourself, uh, which it can be not very fun. However, with this, this can be configured to give you a quaternion or Euler angles, angles directly. Uh, so we just have to ask it, hey, what's my current orientation? And it spits it out and gives it to you. Um, yeah, this session started at, well, nine minutes ago based on my CPU time. Um, but you'll be able to go. It's I'm just kind of rambling for now with an introduction of the robot. Um, as I work my way into showing off the code I've written in LabVIEW. Um, so yeah, so this also connects to the Raspberry Pi over I squared C at the same time that the Pi is talking to the motor control uh, Arduino I've got in the base. And then we've got this GPS, which is just uh, a serial line that comes back to the Pi that it can read to do um, the NEMA message parsing. Uh, all of the code that I'm writing for this is available on GitHub. Uh, actually, I've got that pulled up over here. So if you go to github.com slash negentropicdev, you'll see a bunch of repositories and my overly intense face. Um, so you'll see, I'm working on, I've been uploading stuff for uh, AVR microcontrollers. Uh, this bot rover is the code we'll be looking at that's running on this guy right now. And then I've got a handful of other things such as NEMA parsing for GPS. I've got the Lynx library that I've developed for the for this IMU, and I think that's it for what I've got uploaded for Lynx so far. Uh, <laughs> so back to the code, but yeah, so you're going to run into a situation where you're going to want to interface with some device. For instance, somebody was previously asking um, about, what was it I posted the link for? Oh yeah, doing 4 to 20 milliamp uh, analog output from the Pi. So you might need to interface with an external device over I squared C to accomplish that. And so one of the things you can do is you can write your own code to use the links I squared C functions to accomplish that. Um, and then I've got this camera on here. This is just, um, I'm running MJPEG streamer on this. And this might be working. Okay, I don't know if my battery died in the base, um, but I did have that working last night, of course. Um, so yeah, so let's take a tour of some of the stuff I've written. Also, I've hidden chat again because I'm a professional at this. Let's see. Oh, and I was looking at laughing. I'm batting a thousand here. Uh, all right, so LabVIEW code. Uh, so this is the uh, application uh, that's written in Lynx for uh, for the Raspberry Pi. This is Raspberry Pi 2B. It's uh, one of the older. It's the oldest one you can run Lynx on and LabVIEW on. Uh, so I've got some initialization, all the stuff that runs if initialization worked well, and then we clean up everything we created. So this is the Run VI. Uh, oh no, sorry. This is the Run VI right here. I'm gonna get rid of that guy for now. So we are. Um, well, let's actually start at the beginning. So here we're initializing our uh, Lynx uh, interface, and then we're initializing the I squared C bus. On the Raspberry Pi, you have access to I squared C channel one, 
Uh, so you'll see throughout this application, everything is hard coded for that. And uh, not the most flexible, but it's running on a Raspberry Pi, which only has one. So we're going to initialize our, our GPS instance, our motor controller instance, and uh, our IMU instance. And then we're going to put the IMU in the mode that gives us orientation directly. So once all those are initialized, then we can start um, getting data from them. So my Visa GPS class wraps around my, ne my NEMA parser. So in my NEMA library, I've got that separated from uh, a basic wrapper for doing GPS over Visa serial. Uh, and then the other thing that we're running is a WebSocket server that the uh, that this web page that I have can connect to so it creates a a socket listener uh, a TCP listener and then when it gets a connection it changes it over and does the handshaking for web sockets and then starts to read messages from it and every time we successfully read a message we convert the JSON uh, get out the drive and turn commands and whether or not it told us to stop and then we write them down to the rover and I am going to get this shut down quick because I think it needs a restart I think this page needs to be refreshed that's the problem Oh, that's what it was, the page carrying it inside and outside. So this will drive around. Uh, but let's take a look at the code. So I've got one of the things we can take a look at. Takes a second for the GPS parsing to shut down in the background. So if we take a look at this GPS class, the first thing I do is we initialize it. So that's we're setting up the serial port access. So we're not doing this through links. This is just direct serial port access uh, via the, the, the Raspberry Pi serial line. And uh, we're creating an instance of our NEMA message parser. And then I'm using some by reference stuff so I can pass stuff between the processing loop that's running in the background and then anything that needs that data and then we go ahead and launch the uh, listener where we then parse the NEMA messages and we look at what type of message it is so this library has all of the uh, typical standard message types there will eventually be a means for registering additional uh, NEMA message handlers with it And then on the IMU, so this uses I squared C. So for this, we actually pass our links resource into the device. Ah, yeah, thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, so something that Jeremy just pointed out in chat is YouTube does tend to default to a lower resolution these days. So if things are looking uh, a little blurry, there is a little gear icon you can click in the lower right to uh, set the video quality to a higher value. Um, so because this device is going to be using I squared C functions to um, communicate and pull the data out of this INU, we're passing in our links resource so that it can keep track of it. So I'm lazy, I don't want to keep passing it in. Uh, it would probably be better to pass that in every time you need to do an I squared C function uh, since you might have some race conditions with other devices if you're not careful um, but here we're just going to initialize our uh, our instance and then just as a basic check to make sure everything's initialized correctly uh, we're gonna read some of the device identifiers out of it so these are examples of the I squared C functions that are available in links 
Uh, is there anybody in chat that is not familiar with I squared C and would like me to dive into that a little bit more? Um, but we write, we're, we're going to write down that we're going to ask for an address. We get a bunch of bytes back over the bus from it. And then I'm just using a typecast where I have a cluster I've set up um, that all of these, I, what are these representations? Yeah, these are all U8s. Um, so this is just set up already in the layout of the data that comes back from the device. Uh, so this is a, a really quick, easy way to format the data that you get. And then whenever we need to do things like ask for the orientation, this time we have to do some massaging of the data because uh, we're getting back data in a different byte order than LabVIEW would typically expect it in. So we have to do some rearranging of the bytes, which we can then cast into our 16-bit numbers and then um, do the scaling on them as uh, as described in the data sheet for this IMU. When I set up this IMU to make writing a lot of these functions easier, you'll see I've got some of these enumerations and rings with that I've set up with uh, the registers that I talked to over uh, I squared C with it. And then I label these the same thing as the same identifier that's described in the data sheet for these devices, just so it's really easy as I'm setting up a driver for a device, I can just go, oh, the device, the, the, the register I'm looking for is this name in the data sheet. It makes it really easy to drop down a constant on the, in the lab view code to accomplish that. Then for my motor driving code, we've got, oh, no, wrong one. Where's my rover class? There it is. So we do something similar as the IMU. We pass in our links uh, interface instance, our I squared C bus configuration, and uh, address for the device, which I've got my firmware set to listen on address 40. And then whenever we send down commands, um, we're just building this byte array. So this does do everything in 32-bit floats on the uh, microcontroller. So we're just, I've got this function that does the typecast into a byte array, and then the microcontroller is little endian. So we've got to reverse that order before we send it down so that the AVR can understand that format. And again, I do this trick where I've got an enumeration for uh, any of the register addresses that I have set up on that code. So what does that code look like? I've got this. So this is something that you could do um, if you're starting to run into limitations of things you can do directly from uh, links using their built-in firmware for devices like Arduinos and chip kits and any of that, you can write your own firmware. You can write your own uh, serial protocol that has the commands that you know you're going to need. So it's not going to be this universal do one thing at a time firmware. Uh, you would be able to do whatever you can get an Arduino to do any other time. Um, so that's one of the biggest limitations of doing things with Arduinos. And this would hold true whether you're trying to talk to an Arduino from a Raspberry Pi like I am, or if you're hooking an Arduino up to your PC to do some uh, prototyping and basic I.O. or things like that, uh, you know, you're, you're limited to that do one thing at a, at a time. You can toggle one digital pin. You can set one PWM value. You can read one analog channel at a time. Uh, so I can't accomplish that with a platform. You know, I, I can't work within those constraints with a platform like this. So I'm writing my own firmware for the microcontroller. Uh, and I I do this a little bit differently than, than most people may be familiar with, but all of this can be done directly in the Arduino development environment um, that, and you can use all the existing Arduino libraries. You would just develop your code in the Arduino IDE and then 
flash it to the Arduino, and you would write your LabVIEW code to use your own serial uh, calls instead of using the, the links functions for, uh, for communicating with that. Um, but So I've got this firmware that I've developed. Uh, it's got my own I squared C libraries that I've developed that are all included on that on that bot rover github. Um, I'll also be packaging these separately as well for anybody that's interested in moving away from the Arduino platform. Uh, Arduino platform has less has fewer restrictions than the Lynx toolkit does. Uh, however, I still like to have a little bit more control over what it's doing uh, when it's when it's doing I/O. Um, when you don't use the Arduino I/O functions, you can do stuff like set eight digital pins simultaneously or read eight digital inputs simultaneously. Um, so I've I've done the work to learn how to do all of that myself. Uh, so it's uh, it affords me some more capabilities out of uh, the same exact microprocessor that comes on some of these uh, dev boards. Um, I can I can make them do a little bit more but so again this has uh, I squared C um, unfortunately I don't have my PID stuff running yet correctly yet so this is still really difficult to drive um, but basically we've got this function where uh, we've got this uh, top-level code that runs on the Arduino where we initialize all the devices this is where I've got that address of 40 set up that we saw up in the LabVIEW code. I've got some tuning parameters for this specific robot. And then um, the I squared C code I have uh, reads bytes from the I squared C bus uh, and does then copies those values back into these parameters which I can then use in my code that reads the encoders, does my odometry updates, um, reads back out the pose, the wheel, the chassis velocities, the wheel velocities, and then I can run some uh, control code to drive the wheels. And I'm going to go put this back out in the other room, and we'll demo driving it around. Uh, one of the things I do want to do is I want to restart this. I don't think this works. Maybe it works. We'll see. I might have to completely restart the Raspberry Pi. So here's my little obstacle course I've got set up. But I need I need this to run as a as a deployed executable because running it through the development environment uh, slows things down quite a bit. Okay. So here we can see I'm in my office. And I can drive the robot around from this web page and see the stream of the camera coming back. Yeah, uh, paper towels, but yeah. This is the one stash I have, and I only bought a pack that big because that was the only pack size available when I ran out of, when I, I only normally buy like two at a time because I don't need that much. This is all that was available. But yeah, so you can check out um, this repository uh, if you're curious to see how things are done on the LabVIEW side and you're f or you're familiar with um, doing your own microcontroller programming um, and seeing how I'm doing things on the Arduino board itself. So let's see, we're half an hour in.
Um, so this is right now running as a deployed executable. I've got a build spec for this where I've selected that that LabBot top level VI. And then again, that sets up a, a WebSocket server just so I have a web page that can talk to it directly. Um, I'll probably eventually move away from this WebSocket stuff. It is very abstracted. Eventually, we'll see the uh, TCP function. Um, so this, it works. It is, uh, I'm limited to sending about five joystick commands per second which isn't terrible, but when you're trying to manually directly drive the robot's wheels, that can be a little bit slow of a rate. Um, so yeah, but the, the, the main, oh, you know what, I never actually showed the IMU functionality. Do I have that available recently? Let's take a look at just this guy running. And since I don't have a robot sitting in front of me, I might as well point at me. Yes, I know it's currently running an application. So here's the example just specifically for that IMU that I wrote my custom driver for. So this is pretty similar to what um, Sam Sharp has done for uh, a lot of the Raspberry Pi hats and some of the other devices that his, uh, his libraries are written for. He's got a, a VI package that he's, pa that he's distributed that all with. Um, right now everything of mine is just on GitHub. Uh, once I get a couple of more of these projects done and I get my code cleaned up and documented, uh, I will be looking into doing stuff like VI Package Manager for this stuff as well. I'm going to go grab the robot again so we can watch me tilt it around and see the Euler angles move. So we can see as I go back down to here, as I tilt the robot, the roll changes. We can pitch up and down. We can yaw. And as near as I can tell, this yaw is actually, because it's got a magnetometer for doing part of the orientation, this is actually north, which is cool. And again, if we take a look at this, all we're doing is we're initializing. So this is just a little test VI I have to test my IMU library. Initialize links, initialize the I squared C bus. This time I did actually put that as a control. Uh, and then as long as everything initializes correctly, then we can start getting the calibration status. So this, you have to do things like wave it around and tilt it and set it on its different sides for the uh, accelerometers and gyros and stuff to calibrate themselves. And then, yeah, I showed this function already, uh, this VI. Uh, we can start asking it for orientation. Like good programmers, we clean up after ourselves at the end. Clean up our uh, links I squared C and the links top level resource. So what questions do people have? Feel free at any point to start asking questions about links, about um, custom firmware development. 
So this is going to be a little bit Labview light. I mean, it's been Labview light the whole time. Um, but one of the things I do want to take a look at. I was previewing some of the skydiving videos I opened the video with. Is so getting familiar with uh, data sheets uh, is one of the necessary skills in in starting to move beyond uh, the included firmware for these kinds of platforms and for moving beyond uh, what you can do in uh, using the Arduino functions. So this is the data sheet for this 328P. It's also the same data sheet for a whole bunch of other devices. So for instance, when I was developing this I squared C library that I'm running on this, I was spending a lot of time reading through the two wire interface. And when you're doing your, your bare metal microcontroller programming, you're working with uh, the registers directly. And so the data sheet will, will describe what bits and what registers you have to set. It'll give you example code. That's assembly. That's So there's a C. Uh, so I've written this all in like a mixture of C, C++. It's pretty much all C++. Um, but here's descriptions of like the control register that, that I use to control the I squared C bus from the, the Arduino board. Uh, so Nikola Jabinovich, uh, what about IR remote controls? Uh, so that could be something where I've never used IR myself directly. Um, I'm sure there's gotta be something. There might be something like that built in. But you could do... No, come on, go. There we go. Um, let's see what we have here. Is it used in industrial environment, Lynx or Raspberry Pi? Uh, stuff like this is not designed to be used in industrial environments. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Uh, okay, so I'm not seeing stuff directly in here. So for doing something with an IR remote, I know there are some Raspberry Pi hats that have the IR remote, that have an IR sensor built in. I've got one for the original Raspberry Pi. It's only got the 28 pin header but it does have an IR port on it. I've never used it. I'm not familiar with um, how infrared remotes send their data. So unfortunately, I can't give you a specific answer on that. Yes, um, and that's with the with the LabVIEW Community Edition. It's uh, free for non-commercial use, so that means um, you're not using it in a work environment. You're not using it to make anything you're gonna sell to people. Um, but you can use this to play around and get familiar with uh, the, the LabVIEW environment and uh, see if it's a good fit, see if you like it. Um, me, this is doing this kind of stuff is my hobby. There are industrial versions based on the compute module. So yeah, so they've got... It's like between the size of a normal Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi Zero, where it doesn't have all the the extra um, like display and sound and, and stuff. Uh, it's a little bit of a stripped down. Um, but yeah, so these guys directly is the compute module. What was the hardware compatible with for a compute module? Yeah, there's nothing that stops you from using this stuff in industrial settings. There, 
it would make me nervous personally. Um, there are stuff like technicians that aren't, if, if you can keep it away from people and things like that, I know the people that I develop my software for, uh, I would not trust things that aren't ruggedized and have all the industrial ratings around. Uh, so this is the 2837. It's Cortex-A53. So yeah, I think this is comparable to the newer Raspberry Pis. So the newer compute modules you should be able to run links on, I think. Yeah, so there's stuff like temperature ranges that things get rated for, uh, certain amounts of vibration, uh, you know, any of that that you can manage and are willing to accept the risk on, you can do that. Um, again, right now, with links just being available for Community Edition, uh, technically that's against the license you agree to when you get Community Edition and links. Uh, I think they said that at some point links will be available on the full version of 2020, but I've, I've seen some mixed stuff on that. Yeah, you, you, you wouldn't want to put this in a machine that's going to, that's got a motor spinning and vibrating things around. Um, you, you, you aren't absolutely going to run into problems, but the chances are, are high. You know, somebody earlier was mentioning that they're basically using their Pi to coordinate some, uh, some test bench equipment and doing some GPIB from the Pi. And there, so Darren Nattinger. Okay, so yep, awesome. Thanks for that info, Darren. Um, so one of the other limitations that, that's come up with uh, some people I've been talking to, I think Cyril is one of them, um, is that like the the SPI functionality for links doesn't use the hardware chip select line. So if you're familiar with the SPI bus, or if you're not familiar with, with the SPI bus, the way it works is you've got uh, a data line going out, a data line coming back, and then an, uh, a clock, and it uses a... Um, a digital line to to tell a device, okay, you're the one that's meant to receive or and or send data. And the way the links implements that is it does any of the arbitrary GPIOs, but it's got to do the, it's going to set it, wait to see that it gets changed, then it can start doing the SPI, um, shifting in and out. Whereas the, and so that's, that's, Adds a couple of extra steps, is kind of slow, limits the SPI um, speeds you can achieve, uh, the bandwidth you can get through. Uh, there is a library available that somebody did for uh, the 2014 version of the Lynx Toolkit uh, that does use the actual hardware SPI capabilities of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I haven't seen that it's been fully tested and working on uh, this 2020 release yet. Is BeagleBone Black for industrial? Uh, so it's the BeagleBone Black. So first off, I'm going to start off by saying I, I don't have one. I haven't used one. I do plan on getting one soon. Uh, it's got more I.O. It's got analog inputs directly built onto it. It's got different voltage levels. So like the analog voltage levels are 1.8 volts. Um, it's digital stuff is still 3.3 volts based on what I looked up like 45 minutes ago. Um, So there, there are different considerations you can do with it. It's, it's meant more for doing direct I.O. right out of the box. Uh, it's not... I wouldn't say that it's necessarily more uh, industrial rated because uh, it still has IDC pin headers uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and if people are curious to see what this terrible web page looks like um, that I'm using to do this, so there is a gamepad API available for modern browsers where it can directly read gamepad status. 
and I just directly pulled the demo it has at the end. And then I hooked in some code to set some globals of the different axes, which I then periodically, uh, I, once we establish a connection over the WebSocket, uh, I periodically run my send state method. So five times a second, so this is milliseconds. Uh, and then do some limit checking on the commands, uh, package up this item where everything's stored globally. Again, this is bad practice. This was me throwing together uh, a quick RC demo. Um, but uh, here we can see we're establishing the WebSocket connection to the Raspberry Pis, what it's running, um, and to the port that I had specified in the LabVIEW code. And then we just send JSON formatted data of this object, which has a stop, a drive, and a turn properties in it. <laughs> um, so if you want more information on doing WebSocket stuff from the browser, there is a really great uh, page on the Mozilla on the Mozilla developer network so if you search up WebSocket client MDN you get all the information you would ever need to know about doing WebSocket stuff from the browser so the Xbox controller is not that is being done from the web browser only. Um, the way that works. So the LabVIEW code is, I haven't copied this these two web files into this repository yet. Uh, the way the joystick code works is it runs in a web page which generates a JSON packet that gets sent to this robot over a WebSocket server. So that's where, so as part of, let me... Close this stuff down. So we initialize the system, then in our run, once we have everything initialized, we run our server loop. And I'm using the uh, WebSockets toolkit that's available uh, on the uh, NVI package manager. And it puts the toolkit, all of its VIs and stuff, right here in the data communication palette. Yeah, so people have tried putting things like Raspberry Pi Zeros and stuff on uh, model rockets to do telemetry logging for when they're starting to get into like, vector control and, and guidance on model rockets, and they regularly um, corrupt their SD cards from all of the vibration and forces on stuff like that. So the, the controller status is done in the browser. So there is this uh, JavaScript code that uses the GamePad ABI. Right from Chrome itself. Somebody tried to use the read-only all in RAM with links. Where is that method? Um, yeah, so one, one of the, you know, eventually this thing's going to be autonomous. Uh, I've got, so some, a bunch of the other sensors I was showing off in the beginning, I've got this spinning LiDAR that I'm going to be building a controller for, and that will eventually get mounted on top. Um, and then I've got a whole bunch of ultrasonic sensors that I'm going to use for basic obstacle avoidance. And then the idea is that this thing is going to be remotely controlled. It's all, you know, got enclosed batteries. I can, uh, I've got a second, I've got an old cell phone around here somewhere that I'm planning on putting in it. So even if there's no Wi-Fi, I can still get a basic connection. 
a wireless hat with the Raspberry for the joystick control. Um, so I, you could use, um, you can put uh, USB joysticks on the Raspberry Pi. In fact, let me turn off the webcam and let's see what this looks like when I plug this guy in. Um, I'm, I haven't tried using joystick access directly from LabVIEW and the Raspberry Pi before. Oh, and yeah, speaking of, well, it's not bricked, but I'm pretty sure at this point I've browned out the Raspberry Pi because it is not responding anymore. You see my, my Wi-Fi dongle light just came back. Um, so if you want to... You know, you could do, you could use GPIO to specify, there we go, to specify, oh, maybe, what is going on with my Wi-Fi? To read stuff like buttons and things like that. Um, it is possible to develop your own shared objects that you can call from, I'm just going to... I'm just going to power cycle this guy. Oh, wait, no. Now it's back. Oh, that LS is just extra. Okay. Um, it's probably that device that it does not recognize. So Xbox One controller may or may not work. Um, I'm pretty sure they probably do because there's things like RetroPie that do games <clears throat> but there are function there there are uh, command line apps for Linux that you can use uh, for reading joystick state uh, oh yeah that's what I can check did anything show up as joy in here now so it's it's not recognizing this Xbox One controller I've got. There's probably some driver I can install that'll that'll get it to recognize, but right now it's not working. Yep, I uh, I browned out the Pi. Um, so hit, I, with this example, um, I was unfortunately running into a bunch of bugs with the firmware I was trying to develop for I squared C on the microcontroller, so I didn't get time to flesh this out as much as I'd like. I'm only reading in stuff coming from the web page, uh, but perhaps something we can do really quick is start sending some. Um, maybe let's send the pose data out to uh, the web page. Um, which, unfortunately, okay, now I, I don't have this architected right to make that very feasible, and I'm not, <laughs> not going to try and live code that uh, on this stream. I'll, uh, I'll do some wraps for uh, Matt Pollock's crazy videos, but <laughs> I'll, I'll pre-plan my uh, LabVIEW development a little bit. Um, and then for people that are interested in doing stuff with GPSs, this NEMA library is not specific to uh, links. Uh, if we remember, if we looked at that, no singing, please. Yeah, no, you guys can go find the link for Matt Pollock's video. I will not subject you all to that. <clears throat> so this just uses the the straight um, visa. 
functionality. Um, this isn't using links or anything, so you could hook, you could use this NEMA parser um, to hook the uh, GPS straight up to as a serial device on a PC. Um, you know, this is obviously hooked up to the Raspberry Pi, so this isn't doing anything link specific. And then this NEMA parser, if you're getting if you're getting your data in, not over Visa, uh, the again this. This is just a parser, so this doesn't do any of the I.O. itself. That's why I've separated the NEMA and the Visa GPS libraries. The Visa GPS uses this NEMA parser to collect the data. It moves all of my wires around. Um, Lab UI. So it is just continually in the background. Uh, well, the at least in the Visa GPS case, it's continually listening in the background for data to come in over the serial port, which it then passes into the NEMA parser. Uh, you just pass it in NEMA messages, and then it will fill in the appropriate details on the class, and then you can retrieve that back out. This is by reference, which I know some people will not like. This is these are not pure. This is not a pure class. So these are not pure functions. Um, This will probably respond a lot better when I'm not trying to do the web camera as well. Um, if you're curious about how the web camera is done in uh, on the Raspberry Pi, that's not run through uh, LabVIEW or anything. That is just another script that I've put on the Pi that uses MJPEG. Uh, he he was floating around earlier. Um, this uses MJPEG streamer. You can find instructions for setting that up on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so I just run this separately, and then that web page has the image tag that can read in that image stream from MJPEG streamer, which is configured to run on port 8080. And then the WebSocket is a separate connection, and this is what goes to LabVIEW. But, oh yeah, here's the IMU data. So we could send some of that telemetry stuff. Oh, it's waiting for a connection right now. Where did that? I can't. Oh, I just closed my stream down. Whoops. It's getting a little aggressive and closing down the tabs. trying to find what I did with my remote interface. Uh, so Jack Schmidt is asking in Discord, what is the difference between the DVR and the in-place arrow? So the in-place arrow I've never actually used. I think it allows you to tell the LabVIEW compiler that you're not doing anything with that data anywhere else. I'm not sure. Somebody please fill me in on that. I'm sure I'm wrong on that. Um, but the DVR is what I use for... So if we look at the NEMA parser, we're creating an instance of this data here. 
which is this data type. So this is all of the data we can possibly collect from a GPS. Which satellites are coming in, um, which ones of those are active, uh, what our dilution of precision stuff is, fixed types, speed, lat lawn, all of that data coming in. And we're making a DVR out of this. Um, and I do this as my means of getting the data, hold on a second, of getting my data, which is going to be generated. Well, I've got it set up so I can do this uh, in the background. It's going to be putting all the data in from this loop that's reading the serial port, but then in my top level code, I can pull that out. And it does that by pulling it out of that data value reference. Uh, when you do DVRs with these in-place structures, it allows you to only uh, write data to it in one location at a time. So it's kind of like non-reentrancy on VIs. Um, however, you can set them up so that multiple places can read simultaneously since they won't cause any race conditions with modifying the data. Um, this is kind of it's got all the drawbacks of using things like functional globals, race conditions, stuff like that that you have to work uh, watch out for. Um, however, this this is the mechanism I use to get data between loops where I don't need to worry about like lossless transfer of data through queues or things like that. Um, here in this case, we're just concerned with the most latest data that's been generated from reading GPS. Um, I still don't have the, where did I stick that web page? So right now, the, uh, the WebSocket loop can only close down when it's told to close down from, oh, and my gamepad is plugged into my Pi right now. Uh, it waits indefinitely for a WebSocket connection, so I can only fully close down this application from the web page. Okay, so now that it's done running, um, so yeah, there's this function, um, which is new data value reference. You use this to create a reference to normal LabVIEW data. Um, things that are already reference types are stuff like TCP handles, uh, file references, uh, VI references, things that when you branch the wire, it's still looking at the exact same data. You can branch the wire and still access that same data on a different branch. Just with DVRs, data value references, there's the extra step where you have to use that this uh, dereferencing um, in place structure to get access to that data. Um, there are stuff like Actor Framework allows you to shuffle data between different uh, processes. Uh, I think some of the, the state machine frameworks make it uh, allow you to shuffle data between processes. Um, but again, so I've got, you know, I'm, I'm doing all of this bare metal AVR programming myself. Uh, you can extend the capabilities of Arduino boards and everything just using the regular um, Arduino IDE. Uh, you would set up the, the, the serial port access. You would, you know, maybe you do it in ASCII mode and you send like the letter A to turn out, put one on, like a capital A to turn out, put one on lowercase a, turn output one off. Um, 
maybe one of the commands you send does a handful of things at once. Uh, maybe you send one command and get like five input values read back at once. Uh, when you start developing your own uh, Arduino code, you have a lot more flexibility in the number of things you can do simultaneously because it's not this one package that allows you to to interface to anything, but it's it's not written for a specific application. When you start writing applications specific to your use case, uh, you'll get a lot more performance out of that. And again, you know, if you're, uh, I think, you know, one of the people that was playing around with uh, Lynx uh, back in the beta did a homebrewing monitor where he had some devices set up to monitor the bubbling coming through the airlock on the top of his um, fermentation uh, jug. And so he had a, he could see a history of how much his, uh, his yeast was providing him uh, CO2 generation. And he could monitor temperature and things like that. Um, and stuff like that is is great. You know, you're just, you know, maybe once a second you're going to, okay, what's, is, is my uh, bubble sensor tripped? What's the current temperature? Um, so things that are, are nice and slow like that. The Lynx Toolkit is great for starting to get in this, you know, doing more stuff at once. You'll start to see the bottlenecks. All right, what question? Any more questions? So I know in uh, Sam's presentation, some people asked about running links on a Raspberry Pi Zero, which you cannot do. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Zero's processor is older and doesn't run the, the, the actual CPU instruction set that would support running the uh, Lynx environment on it. Uh, one of the things I'm waiting to arrive is this Banana Pi M20, which I mentioned in his, uh, in his chat. Uh, so this is in the form factor of a Pi Zero. This this doesn't cost. This costs more than five dollars. Uh, it's like eighteen dollars right now on on AliExpress. Um, but it's got the same specs as a Raspberry Pi Three. It's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in. So this will be one of my next projects. This robot is kind of thrown together really quickly <laughs> because I was hoping to have this arrive. I ordered this like two months ago, uh, but you know. COVID and shipping from China. Um, and then I'd have something taking up this much room instead of this much room. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, if you're not following me on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter. I post about all of this, uh, the link stuff I'm working on, uh, all my open source LabVIEW libraries that I'm working on. Uh, eventually, I do plan on, on moving them into uh, JKI has done their community package program now. Uh, and once I start getting all of my libraries cleaned up and get examples fleshed out and build packages for all of them, I'll start submitting them to uh, VI Package Manager community. All right, Kurt, thanks for stopping in. I'll catch you later. So this is something, I'm, so this little guy is like one and a half times more powerful than the old Pi 2. It's got more memory than I have on my Pi 2. So, um, you know, one of the future things I'll be working on is using one of the Arduino clones to interface to this guy because you have to manually control the motor speed to achieve the uh, proper spin rate. Um, but this is a LiDAR that would give you a full 360 scan of distance measurements. Um, and so this will be one of the things I start doing. Uh, and then, you know, processing 360 data points um, every couple of seconds 
uh, you know, having something with a little bit more power behind it would be very nice on the LabVIEW side. Um, as I said before at the beginning, I do my own expansion board design, and one of my plans is to kind is to uh, develop a you know under the new Pi Hat format instead of the old Pi One twenty eight pin format. Um, basically integrate most of these capabilities. So something that'll have the uh, motor drivers built onto it. It'll have a, the microcontroller on it that can... Uh, my hand is not close enough. Um, it'll have the microcontroller on it for doing things like uh, odometry. So it'll have everything basically needed to do to do a two-wheel robot, and then there will be uh, code that I write in LabVIEW. You'll be able to It'll have programming headers so you can reprogram it from the Arduino environment or if you want to do your own programming. I just, I've got like 10 other parts of this project that I want to get done before that. So that w probably won't happen until probably in the fall. Yeah, and this was... This was a bit of a whirlwind tour of web and AVR and links. Let's see, is there anything coming across? Nope, no more questions in the Discord. So I think we'll just... Um, oh, a couple, I don't remember Sam um, showing this when he talked about, why is it, okay, there we go. Um, when you are, one of the things you do want to do when you're setting up your interfacing options for serial is you don't want to pick yes on this option. You don't need console access over the serial. Uh, if you if you select this option for yes, then the system itself will take over control of that serial port, and it won't be available to you in um, in LabVIEW. But you do want it enabled. Uh, I'm curious if anybody else has has tried using serial ports from there uh, from there uh, with links before. Uh, one of the things I noticed that I had to do. Um, oh, it's in here. Is I've got to run this Visa Find resource for links to realize, uh, for, not for links, for my other Visa read write functions to become available. Um, it will not find the serial port if I don't call that, um, find visa ports first. Now Lynx does have its own stay open. Lynx does have its own serial functions that probably work a little bit better but I'm using this uh, pin. Thank you. Um, I'm using my GPS library that I wrote to also run from PCs or or other systems. Although these are probably Okay, so yeah, so these do, these aren't using Visa directly. This this is using uh, part of the library that they have to, uh, available. Uh, Darren, if you're still in chat, is the source code for these libraries available that some of us could perhaps tinker with?
All right, it looks like Nanninger has left the building. Yeah, I, as long as you call that one, from what I've seen, as long as you call that one VI first, it, it, Visa then begins to work. Yeah, you know, once you do this, Visa works, and then I don't have to worry about all those separated code paths or anything like that. Oh, this thing has like half a second of latency. I need to get better containers for all of my uh, random development boards I've got strewn about. Yes, is when you're uh, deploying a Lynx app to the Pi, it even sends all the libraries down for devices you're not using. Which it looks like it's probably stripping the VIs out because I'm not using them. There's, uh, there's quite a bit to send down. All right, well. This, we are uh, 15 minutes past, and uh, I want to make sure everybody is ready for the next session, which is going to be the FPGA Advanced Sessions. And that is run by Cyril. So we will go ahead and cut this stream down. Um, if anybody has any questions about how I... Um, you know, wrote any of this code where I found information for, for the stuff. Uh, any project you might be working on that you're just curious, maybe have some some questions on where to find information or, or how to get started, uh, feel free to uh, chat it up in the Discord channel for the Lynx Toolkit present uh, for this session. Okay, so... Becky Linton has clarified the in-out um, elements on in-place structures. They accept any data type and requires the right-hand side to be wired. It replaces the resulting data in the same memory location. So yeah, so it, it basically tells the compiler, don't make a copy of this data that I'm using inside this in-place element structure. So for anybody that might not be familiar so Jack had asked about this guy um, so the the in out uh, tells lab view I might branch that wire that comes out of here within this structure but only keep track of what's in here um, and and make sure it doesn't it you know it, it doesn't get a different copy that's put somewhere else
All right, well, thanks for everybody that stopped in. Looking forward to the rest of these VI week sessions. And uh, now that I'm not under pressure to get the most basic of, function of joystick driving working for this rover, um, I hope some of you are interested in, in seeing some of this robotic stuff and uh, we'll see some of the actually neat stuff <laughs> I've got planned for this guy. Uh, so thanks for everybody that stopped in. We'll catch you all later.